World War I, the home front. Remember when we talk about the home front, we're not talking about the battle front. That's where the fighting takes place. The home front is back in the country. Yes, Brecken? That, that's your, your, your home. Zero, zero, zero. Yeah, that's how much, yeah. The home front is where the citizens are, where the people not doing any of the soldiering, not doing any of the fighting. World War I is a good example of total war. Now, World War II will surpass it in many respects. But World War I is called a total war because you are devoting all aspects of society. What, Breck? Um, B for yeah, B for Brecken on the keyboard. Don't touch. All aspects of society are needed and committed to the war. You're trying to defeat the enemy on the home front as well as the battle front. Daddy. That means you need to organize production and distribution and win the emotions of Americans. What, sweetie? Uh, uh, um, can I go back to my drawing? Yes, you can go back to your drawing. Say bye. Say bye to the camera. No. Okay. The Committee on Public Information is created to win the American hearts and minds. It's headed by George Creel, a former muckraker, and he recruits literally thousands of people in the arts, in advertising, in the film industry, general public speakers, and their job is to publicize and sell this war to the American people. He even organizes voluntary censorship by the press to make sure only positive stories are published. They create posters and war advertising to keep support for the war high. They publish pamphlets with all sorts of information in multiple languages so American immigrants can read the propaganda as well. Part of the Committee on Public Information is the Division of Industrial Relations. And this is the part that is going to be secretly funding some pro-war groups. They're going to... Um, uh, they're also going to work hard to get labor to support the war. More on that later. All of this propaganda leads to some real anti-German feelings. The four-minute men that we learned about gave speeches saying why we went to war. And a lot of that is talking about Germans being evil. And the CPI also promoted movies that showed Germans as beasts, as monsters, and as extremely cruel. Those anti-German feelings really affect society. Many schools stopped offering German language classes. German foods either became uh, hard to purchase or had their names changed, like sauerkraut being called Liberty Cabbage. And German composers, uh, the music by German composers was not played by symphonies around the country. The um, conductor for the Boston Symphony, who was from Germany, was even sent to an internment camp and then later sent to Germany. We also have some extreme cases where that patriotism becomes excessive and we have violence. One notable incident took place in Missouri, where Robert Prager, who was born in Germany but lived in the United States for most of his life, tried to join the U.S. Navy was denied for medical reasons and then was lynched in Missouri by a mob be simply for being German. You might wonder why people were so scared, why people were so worried. Well, there were real threats. There were German spies operating here in the United States. There were German agents trying to encourage American workers to go on strike. Remember, during World War I, what the Germans had done with Vladimir Lenin. They had allowed him passage through Germany to get him back into Russia so that he could um, start the Russian Revolution and get Russia out of the war. You have to remember, too, that Americans had really been divided on entering the war. There were a lot of people of German ancestry. There were a lot of people of Irish ancestry who don't want to see us siding with Britain either. As a result, the government has to step in and do something. And the first step 
happens in 1917. President Wilson called Congress to create the Espionage Act. And what this does is allow the federal government to lock somebody up in prison for up to 20 years for helping the enemy. That might include obstructing recruiting or just generally encouraging disloyalty. This act also allowed the post office to censor mail. Later, the Trading with the Enemies Act of 1917 allowed for the censorship of foreign language press. So the newspapers in the big cities that were read by immigrants could be censored by the federal government. Probably most important, though, is the Sedition Act of 1918, which generally said you cannot talk bad about the government or the military. This is an extreme limit on our freedom of speech. More than 1,500 people are put in jail, and most of those are reporters and writers. This act makes it to the Supreme Court in the landmark case Schenck versus the United States. Schenck was a guy who had was speaking out against the draft during the war. And what the Supreme Court said was they were allowed to lock him up for that. The Supreme Court said that the First Amendment does not protect the freedom of speech against the draft during a war. Some other victims of these wartime policies would be the Socialist Party. These laws are used to go after the Socialist Party. Their publications are removed from the mail. And Eugene Debs, the leader of the American Socialist Party, is arrested on the Espionage Act. In 1920, Debs is still the Socialist Party's candidate. He runs from jail, which is an important, well, it's a kind of an interesting side note in history, but it also is the end of the U.S. Socialist Party after that. Wobblies many of whom opposed the war. The IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, who are sometimes called Wobblies, opposed World War I. Many of them opposed all wars. One notable IWW leader was Frank Little, and he opposed any war except class war, he said. However, he was lynched in Montana for those views. Big Bill Haywood, another IWW leader, flees the country uh, over the fear for his safety. How is the United States going to pay for World War I? How is the United States going to pay for World War I? After all, World War I ended up costing $32 billion for the United States. At the time, our normal government yearly budget was $1 billion. So a lot more expensive. Most of the war is going to be funded through Liberty Bonds. U.S. savings bonds sold during the war. They might also be called war bonds. But a large chunk of money will also come from the newly created 16th Amendment, which created federal income taxes. Staying with economics, the government creates organizations to oversee all aspects of the U.S. economy during the war. And the most important is the War Industries Board, which is headed by Bernard Barak who the government hires from Wall Street. What they're going to do, the War Industries Board, is three things. Determine priorities. They're going to figure out what's most important for us to be making. Then they're going to allocate raw materials. They're going to figure out which factories get what stuff and how much. And finally, they're going to set prices. The War Industries Board is basically going to tell American companies what they could and could not make during the war, and they're going to even tell some industries how much of something they need to make. Government also creates the Food Administration, and it is headed by future President Herbert Hoover. Remember, America not only has, or American farmers not only have to feed Americans, they also have to feed American soldiers. They also have to feed almost all of Europe at this time, or at least the Allied powers. To conserve food, to make sure there's enough for everybody, they institute things like meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays. Many Americans grow victory gardens to raise their own vegetables so that they're not consuming uh, any more, let's say, from the grocery store. All of this is done to conserve. To conserve fuel, the Fuel Administration is created, which create and, and they 
create gasless days. Those were days that motorists were not allowed to drive. And they even closed some non-essential factories. During World War I, the government is going to control the economy as never before in U.S. history. For example, when there's a strike in the telephone companies, the government simply took over the telephone companies. Now, as we're talking about business, we should also mention that wartime contracts are generally good for business. And World War I is no exception. Corporate profits tripled from the beginning of the war to the end of the war. Let's talk about labor next. President Wilson tells labor that we can't afford to have any strikes during the war. So he works with Samuel Gompers, the leader of the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. And the AFL sees its membership grow by over a million new members. Wilson wants to avoid strikes from all these workers, so Wilson sets up the War Labor Board. And the War Labor Board publicly supports eight-hour workdays in war factories, uh, factories that have wartime contracts, better wages and working conditions. Basically, if you want a government contract, you've got to follow these regulations that the War Labor Board is laying out. And they also allowed workers in those factories to unionize, which means that they can use collective bargaining. When World War I breaks out, there are very few immigrants coming to America from Europe. It's just not feasible to leave Europe at this time. This means that there's a real shortage of workers in American industry, and as a result, business owners turn to some other sources. For example, women. Women did work in factories during World War I. Not as much as in World War II, but they did work in factories during World War I. The War Labor Board ordered women to be paid equal pay for equal work. Now, oftentimes that meant women were given different jobs so they could be paid less. And few women actually left the house to go to the factory. That's what will happen in World War II. These are mostly single women working in factories during World War I. However, it does create some new opportunities, but the rights for women in the workplace are somewhat inconsistent. Another new source of labor that factory owners turn to are African Americans, most of whom are still in the South when World War I breaks out. Recruiters from factories head South and encourage migration, and the results are overwhelming. We have massive migration from 1916 to 1918. Almost half a million African Americans moved to the industrial cities of the North, like Detroit and Cleveland. This brings about a real change in lifestyle for these African-American migrants. They're going from farm work to clockwork, and we've kind of talked about those changes when we talked about the Industrial Revolution. This also puts African-Americans in direct competition for housing and jobs, and this leads to some racial conflict in the North. Some notable incidents were in St. Louis in 1917, almost 50 people were killed in a racial conflict. And in Chicago in 1919, as well as many other cities that year, almost 40 people were killed in Chicago alone. Also at this time, in 1915, as African Americans start moving north, the Ku Klux Klan is reestablished and it's no longer going to be isolated in the South. With the uh, recreation of the Klan, we can also see the rise in African Americans being lynched. Mexican Americans almost doubled their population from 1910 to 1920. This has a lot to do with relaxed immigration laws from the government, and that was mainly uh, the cause, or that was mainly caused by farmers needing cheap labor. So the government relaxed those immigration laws, so Mexican Americans could come over and work in the farms and fields of the Southwest and Texas and, and uh, many parts of the country. Many of these Mexican-Americans migrated to northern towns for wartime factory jobs like African-Americans as well. One major global result from World War II or World War I is that when the war started in 1914, our government is in debt and Americans on their own owed $3 billion to foreign investors. However, by the end of the war, 1919, we are a creditor nation. Other countries owe us $10 billion, and American individuals are 
owed $3 billion. So economically, you could say we made out pretty well in World War I. 